with some of our panelists speaking. Um, before we get going, just a few things uh, on the horizon. On the 17th, that's next Monday, we'll be screening a documentary called Hard to Believe, uh, which is a, about uh, Chinese organ harvesting networks. Uh, pretty shocking, so that should be interesting. On the 19th, Wednesday, the program, which hasn't been uh, put out yet, is on mental health. Um, and we have a very interesting panel of people coming together, including Samaritans and people who have to uh, deal with the problems here. Uh, and we have a photo exhibi exhibit kicking off on the 21st, Are you the of it? which is Through the Eyes of an uh, Internally yes. Displaced Person. Uh, and those are photographs by Kayla Richards. These are part of the new uh, regular exhibitions that we're creating here. And I think that pretty much does us. So to this evening, um, last Thursday, October 6th, was the uh, 40th anniversary of the uh, attack massacre at Tamasat University which left uh, about 49 people dead officially. Excuse me, the program's running. About 49 people uh, were killed. It could have been a m a many more than that. Hundreds were hurt. Uh, it led to a mass exodus of students uh, to the jungles, uh, created a problem that was not resolved until probably the mid-'80s. Um, and it is one of the uh, watermark watershed events uh, in post-war Thai history, recent modern history. Uh, tonight we've got three very distinguished historians who are going to give you a much better rundown on that. Uh, before they join us, we're going to go through uh, some of the witnesses to it who were reporting the story. Uh, and we have Neil Ulovic, uh, who is sitting in Denver uh, at this moment. It's 6.30 in the morning. He's got out of bed to talk to us. Uh, Neil Olovich uh, was a, a photographer with the uh, Associated Press and his pictures are iconic uh, of what happened at Tamasat that day and they won for him a, a World Press Award and subsequently a Pulitzer Prize uh, for spot photography. Um, and it has to be said that there are, there are other photographs from that era that are equally iconic. We'll be showing a few. Uh, one set was shot by um, Kripit and who uh, was actually stopped from shooting more because he, got, he himself was wounded. He got shot in the neck. Um, we have Klaus Brett here, who covered the political events uh, in Thailand during the 70s for UPITN, uh, which is um, a, a, a conglomerate, if you like, of uh, news coverage. And he also filed at that time for Swedish Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, and we have uh, Derek Williams of Asia Works, who, found, who was filing at that time, filming for CBS News. Uh, he was a veteran of the Vietnam War, Cambodia, Vietnam. Uh, and we're also going to be screening from uh, Derek a little bit later on a very interesting interview that he did with Samat Sundarawet just after he became Prime Minister. And he talked about what happened at Tamasat. So to kick off, before, before I bring up the academics who are having finishing their dinner, uh, Neil, can you hear me? How's the sound? I can hear you, and the sound is okay. Uh, we're getting intermittent breaks now and then, so if everything uh, crashes, we it will not be a terrible surprise. Well, Neil, thank you very much for getting out of bed. Uh, I hope you find it worthwhile. Uh, can you take us back to that day in 1976 when you shot these pictures? Just walk us through the assignment uh, and what happened to you that day. Well, of course, the uh, uh, situation is be, uh, becoming more and more chaotic, uh, day on day, week on week. Uh, I first got a call about, uh, I would guess, about 7 o'clock in the morning um, from one of our Thai reporters uh, at AP. Uh, it had been going on all night, but he didn't bother to tell me that. Actually, he had gotten back to the bureau to file and um, called the bureau chief, and uh, the bureau chief said, uh, did you tell the photo department by any chance? And the answer was no. So uh, he called me and didn't uh, uh, go into detail. I took my equipment very quickly and took a taxi uh, uh, to the campus. Um, because of this miscommunication, uh, I ended up being there at a time when it was just 
getting hotter and hotter and worse and worse. And uh, so the miscommunication resulted in me being there at the right time. Uh, a uh, the Thai reporter that I mentioned and a Thai photographer who had, for AP who had learned about it separately had come back to the Bureau to file their material, ever mindful of deadlines. Once I got there, the situation was so uh, uh, chaotic and potentially murderous that uh, I thought, uh, deadlines be damned. <laughs> I'm staying until the end. So what time did you get there? I'm th the whole thing kicked off at about 6.30 in the morning. It would about been about 7.30, I would guess. Right, and what was happening? Were you inside the campus or were you on Sanam Luang? I walked inside the campus. Um, and as I later reflected in a, in a story that nobody seemed to notice my existence, which was fine with me, of course, I went in and uh, uh, started photographing. The military was on one side of the football field. The students were in a building on the other side, the left-wing students. And uh, outside campus, there was a large assemblage of uh, uh, very angry right-wing students. Um, and so I began to photograph. And the situation became worse and worse with more and more shooting, even the use of a recoilless rifle by the military. Um, and uh, at length, uh, the students, the left-wing students surrendered and were made to lie down, face down on the football field. And not too long after that, I uh, thought it is a very good time to leave simply because I was waiting for somebody to come up and say, you, your film, now. <laughs> right. Um, and so I went to the gate. Right, he's hung. My way through there, took some more pictures, and uh, I saw uh, commotion under several trees at Sanam Luang. I walked over there, and that's where the, the chair and the hanging picture was made. Um, I stopped and looked around to see if anyone was watching me. No, I couldn't find anybody watching me. Everybody was transfixed by this image of a man with a folding chair beating a corpse on the head. So I shot a few frames, uh, ever mindful of the possibility of uh, the crowd turning on me. Then I went over to the other tree where I'd seen a hanging and photographed that also, and then um, walked across on him along and hailed a taxi as if nothing were wrong, and returned to the Bureau. Right, before that, when you were in photographing inside the campus, were you aware of, of fire coming back towards the, the, the police and the, the forces with the recallist rifles, the heavy weapons? Was it Down a very back, one I'm sorry, you're breaking up. Please repeat that. Were you aware of any firing coming back from the students when you were still inside the campus? Did you notice anything? Um, it was too chaotic to know for sure. At any rate, if there was firing coming back from the left-wing student side, it was very, very minor compared to um, what was going on from the right-wing side towards the left-wing. When you went out into Sanam Luang, you've, you've spoken about seeing two students uh, hung who'd been dragged there, I presume. They weren't, they weren't killed outside. They were already dead and dragged there. Is that correct? Is that your impression? You're going to have to speak closer to your mic. The students that you saw hanging, they had been killed elsewhere and, and brought to the trees and hung up, or were they killed at Sanam Luang? I have no idea. Okay, you have um, no idea. The, uh, when I left the campus and saw the commotion around the trees, uh, they had been hanging for a bit and they were definitely dead. Yeah. Uh, it's very likely that uh, they had left the campus trying to escape and unknowingly ran into the arms of a right-wing mob. And did you see anything else uh, in terms of atrocities at Sanam Luang before you left? Say it again, please. Did you see anything else at Sanam Luang in terms of atrocities, apart from the two students, before you left? Well, on campus, there were uh, a number of uh, um, dead bodies, people, uh, students who had been shot. Um, and uh, I understand uh, other students uh, made for the river, trying to escape that way. Um, but at this point, I was very anxious to uh, uh, 
having made these pictures to get them back to the Bureau. Makes I didn't see anyone else from AP there, so I realized that uh, AP would be relying on me for the story as well as the uh, photographs. Right. Now, just briefly, in, in terms of your career, you've seen quite a lot. How, how did this day measure up for you as a, as a professional? Well, you know, I came to uh, Asia in the first place because I was fascinated with, fascinated by China. And uh, ultimately, I ended up there for some years. But, you know, every place I lived in Asia, and there were quite a number of them, was fascinating in its own way, uh, Thailand uh, especially. Uh, you know, my years spent in Thailand were very good years, and uh, uh, among other things, my, my son was born there while we lived there. So um, in many ways, uh, my time in Thailand was uh, very, very interesting and well spent. Uh, leave aside the fact that these pictures um, were a high point uh, of my career. Do you think it was the most important picture that you took, the chair picture, which has become iconic? As I said, it's the image that everybody always uh, associates it's with. It's difficult to say. History uh, makes a decision, and history takes its time to make that decision. Great. Look, thanks very much, Neil. Please stay with us and chip in if you hear anything. Um, we're now going to go to Klaus Brett, who will talk a little bit about uh, covering it well, I, I look forward to uh, uh, listening to uh, uh, others there until <laughs> the signal on this wonderful Skype connection uh, implodes. Uh, I do want to say hello to my, my old colleagues and brothers in uh, uh, Thai coverage uh, who are sitting there on your, on your uh, front panel there and uh, wish them the best. It's uh, very pleasing to be invited to take part in this. We've also got Paul Waddell, the enemy from UPI here. So, <laughs> okay, Klaus, can you can you bring us up to speed on on TV coverage for that? What it was like? Right, um, things had been building up for quite some time. Um, you had the fall of Indochina, uh, uh, the Lao royal family disappearing. Uh, there was a rise in in right wing violence. Uh, Labor leaders and, and union leaders were attacked. Hey, you cannot hear? Yeah. Just a bit louder. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, at the end of February uh, 76, Dr. Boon Sanong, who was uh, a high profile, uh, uh, I think he was the Secretary General of the uh, Socialist Party, was assassinated. Uh, that followed by more murders. Uh, there was a campaign of assassinating farmer leaders. Uh, I think 18 were killed. Uh, so there was a constant buildup of violence, right-wing violence. Um, so it wasn't really, uh, it, it felt like a culmination. Uh, there had been demonstrations at Sanam Luang uh, against the return of uh, uh, Tanom, uh, who returned to Thailand uh, in, in the guise of a Buddhist monk. Uh, the student, uh, students uh, moved from Sanam Luang into Tamasat, uh, into campus. Um, in the morning of October 6, uh, I was sharing a house with a Thai photographer with UPI, Craig uh, uh, Pitpanwut Ott, uh, who had very good contacts. He got a call, uh, and we got into his car and drove over to uh, Sanam Luang at dawn. Uh, and there wasn't much going on. Uh, there were some BPP uh, soldiers uh, hiding around m by the trees. Uh, and up against the gate and the fence near the uh, National Museum was a cluster of, of uh, young men, um, Red Guards, Katindang. And uh, we went over there and uh, they welcomed us. Uh, we were on the right side of the fence. and. Um, uh, they showed their weapons, they had knives, there was a machete or two, uh, there were pistols, uh, revolvers, um, and there was sporadic gunshots. And uh, I think to me the most chilling moment was realizing that these, these young guys were there uh, with a mission. 
and the mission was to kill people, to kill, kill these students. Um, gunfire started escalating, um, and um, at some point, uh, a bus was commandeered and driven through, through the front gates, and students were moving on the inside towards the auditorium. Uh, somebody threw a hand grenade, uh, and several of them were killed. Their bodies were dragged out into the street. Uh, and these students started pouring in, uh, the, not students, uh, these Katindang started pouring into uh, onto campus. Uh, Art, who shot this, shot this picture, uh, went inside and uh, was, was shot in the neck. Um, and that was the end of, uh, of, of my uh, time at the campus that morning because I, I took him to the police hospital, which was a odd little journey in itself. And we're talking about this, driving down Petbury Road where shoppers were out as normal, uh, buses going to and fro, uh, like nothing was unusual was going on in the city. Uh, we get to uh, the police hospital at Rappersholm and uh, there is chaos. Uh, lots of people being brought in. Uh, I, I get art taken care of. I go to the UPI office to file. Uh, I go back to the police hospital to find art and find his car keys to retrieve his car, and uh, they deny any knowledge of him. He is not there. I go to the morgue, uh, not there, back to the hospital, and uh, I say, I, I know he's here. I brought him myself and finally uh, uh, got to him, and uh, the ward was full, uh, and uh, the, the uh, injured were guarded by, by police. Uh, I got back to Sanam Luang when things were pretty much over. There were pyres still smoking, but, but uh, the energy had gone out of the whole thing. Um, but uh, Derek uh, was there when it was more we, intense. We were there about the same time as Neil. Um, I think we probably arrived a little after him. We got a phone call again, and uh, we were a crew of four, uh, three, uh, Peter Collins, myself, and Kurt Hoefler. And we, we arrived at the front gate when we s where we saw this uh, Border Patrol policeman firing a bazooka right into the, in, in, into the uh, Thomas on campus, which was amazing. <laughs> I thought, what, what in the heck's happening? And as Neil mentioned, the, the intensity of the firing just increased, increased, increased. And at, at one point, I remember we, we were wiggling towards, I into the campus through the gate, and Neil was there beside me, and he said, have you, you noticed most of this fire is outgoing, it's not incoming? Because we were all worried about being hit. But in fact, it was the it was the, the right wingers and the BPP who were doing all the shooting. Uh, we came back out, and then oh no! First of all, in in the quadrangle at Tamasan, they had all the students lying on their on their stomachs, and and these BPP guys and and Kratten Dang were walking on their backs, and anyone who was wearing spectacles or glasses was a sign that they were a communist. So they would smash them with their, with their foot. They would, they would just put their boots down on these glasses and smash them. And as several, I mean both Neil and Klaus, the, the whole thing was nobody noticed that you were filming. I remember we were in a circle of guys who were kicking a guy to death, a student, a left-wing student to death. And I kept looking around saying, Somebody's going to notice this. I mean, they've got, they've got to come and take our camera away or take the film. But they were all so intent on their mission that they wouldn't, they couldn't be, you know, you, you, you could roam at will, film what you wanted. Nobody was stopping you. We eventually had to had come back into town to get somebody to carry our film to Hong Kong because you couldn't satellite from Bangkok at, during, at a time of a coup. So we, we rushed back here and our office was in the car park next to this building. And I remember we, I had just arrived in 
back in Bangkok in at the beginning of 76 and was still full of the land of smiles uh, stuff. And we were all sitting in stone cold silence in the car. And we drove up Rama 1 and to Plunchet. And we realized that everybody was just shopping away, doing their thing, and nobody knew anything about what was happening just across town at Tamasan. And that horrified me, quite frankly. And then Kurt, my German colleague, said, as we sat in this silent car, he said, that's the end of the land of smiles for me. And uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Right, well, we'll just go back to one more thing that you did, uh, which was that you interviewed, uh, you photographed the interview of Sir Mark Sundarawet in 2008 after he had become Prime Minister. Uh, and this was done for 101 East, which is an Al Jazeera show at the time. Yeah. And uh, Selena Downs went through first Takbai and what was going on in the South. And then she brought up the subject of 1976. Now, we've got it on there. Um, if you start at um, 7, 7, oh, 7, 1, 5 on the clock, we won't waste any time. And then I'm going to ask you to jump uh, when you get to 11, jump to, M to 12, which will save time as well. That catches all the stuff that's relevant to Tamasat. You got it? 7.15, 7 7.15, the key up. So this is the tail end of talking about Takbai. So the chapter is that we have to run, we 
Okay, just jump it forward to 12, because that's, that's the last thing he says about uh, Tamasat. 12 minutes in, towards the end. It's the, very, it's the tail end where he ticks her off again. No, you've dropped it. Is that it? 12? This is... Can you get it forward? If not, we'll abandon it. Well done. Yeah. yeah, okay, just leave it at that. It'll run through it. I should point out that I filmed that interview and it, I had to restrain myself from jumping out from behind the camera and punching him in the nose. Um, because I had seen him at St. Amlong the day before. He was driving a little Austin A30 or A35 uh, and he had his radio program and he came out to visit the crowd. And when I mentioned to him later, he denied ever, ever having been there. But anyway, right. Well, uh, Samak died the following year. Actually, he was uh, he, he he didn't see out more than eight months as prime minister. Right. On that note, let's move on to our academics. If I can invite you to join us. Um, I don't. I don't think we've ev ever actually had a more distinguished panel. Thai historians uh, sitting. We've also got uh, a very distinguished uh, Farang historian sitting at the bar, Chris, Chris Baker. So welcome. Um, so just briefly, uh, Ajahn Ch Chanvit Katsitsit, sorry, made a mess of that, studied diplomacy and history at Tamasart and took his PhD in Southeast Asian history at Cornell. He was rector of Tamasart in the mid-1990s. Uh, and had started out there as, the, uh, as a lecturer in the history department. Uh, Chaiwat Satanand uh, is a professor of political science currently at Tamasat and director of the Thai Peace Information uh, Center. He's an expert on nonviolence, political activism in Islam, uh, and has written uh, a number of research articles and book chapters on October the 6th, where he had actually graduated quite recently uh, in 76 and was a, a young lecturer at that time. Um, and then we have uh, Tong Chai Winichikun, who is uh, 
Professor Emeritus of Southeast Asian History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and who was actually a student activist at Tamasart in October that year. Uh, and following the massacre, he was imprisoned for two years. Um, and then went on to complete his degree at Tamasat. He returned, did a PhD at the University of Sydney, and in 2001 became a full professor at um, Wisconsin Madison. Uh, his book, Siam Mapped, A History of the Geobody, Geobody of a Nation, uh, was published in 1994 and is one of the most celebrated books, uh, historical books on Thailand in the last few decades. Now, what we're going to do is uh, divide it up, and we're going to talk, uh, we're going to start with Ajahn Chanvit, who's going to give us uh, a, a broad picture view of where 76 fits into these terrible incidents that have occurred in Bangkok. So you have 73, 76, 1992, and 2010, uh, and they're similar but different. So Ajahn Chanvit, can you explain more about them to us? Uh, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's the night that I do not want to speak as academic. I love to be a reporter tonight. I uh, graduated from Thammasat University in 1963. I was about two years behind Samak and Chuan Lik Pai. And I can guarantee you that he's a big liar. <laughs> if he's not dirty, he wouldn't come this far. <laughs> I am rather clean, so I got stuck here. <laughs> well, uh, after graduation, uh, I won all kinds of uh, awards. So they sent me to Occidental College, Los Angeles. You know who went to school there. Uh, I spent two years uh, at Oxy, Los Angeles, and I got to know a lot about uh, what uh, riots. Uh, I got to know about uh, human rights. I got to know about the Vietnam War. So I, I lived with two old ladies in Los Angeles, suburb of uh, Los Angeles, uh, between Pasadena and Pomona and all this, you know. So I, I got to know a lot about the Vietnam War, you know. And I think you uh, reporter are quite right, you know, when you saw October 6th. It's uh, unthinkable. Uh, uh, same to me too, you know, unthinkable. We, I, I saw the, the Vietnam War in America. I participated in the demonstration we went down to uh, Washington DC trying to kick out uh, Nixon and install uh, George McGovern, you know, <laughs> all this. So I spent uh, two years in Los Angeles. I spent five years at Cornell, you know, where they supposed to be sort of brainwashing us, you know, in America and sent back to, uh, to Thailand now. So I spent five years in America. I in, at Cornell. I came back in the end of 1972. So I saw October 14. I came back on time to be part of October uh, 1473 uprising, and I stay on until October 6, 1976. I was a deputy of Dr. Poi Eng Phagorn, the rector of Thammasat. Uh, on October 6th, I was, October 5th, we were at the university. We had a meeting, the rector and four vice rectors. The following day, I crossed the river from Tonburi to a meeting with Dr. Boy, and that's the day that he was looking at the morning uh, Bangkok Post with the picture of hanging. So we had uh, a meeting on October 6th uh, morning, and then he resigned, as you know, and uh, he said goodbye to me. He told me to take his old Mercedes-Benz, which is uh, an official car, take it back, and then this is my briefcase uh, take it back to my house. 
that's the last word he said to me. And a brave uh, woman, uh, Ajahn, picked him up. She's the one who is now working at Voice of America in Washington, D.C. Her name is Nityaya Pung Pung. So I saw October 14, I saw October 6, and then I uh, did a lot of teaching, you know, at Thomasa University. Uh, I, I, I did uh, history is a subject that uh, rather unpopular at Thomasa. So I don't understand why Tong Chai and Somsak uh, took history. <laughs> <laughs> they took history uh, with me, you know, uh, Tong Chai and Somsak. Uh, they are doing, doing well, uh, well, especially Tong Chai, uh, doing quite well, you know. Uh, but Somsak is now in Paris. Anyway, uh, I stay on at Thammasat until, well, I became dean of uh, liberal arts and later at, uh, as rector, you know. I was inspired by Dr. Poi that I must become rector of Thammasat University. But I was there only for nine months, you know, it's too much, so I resigned. So I stay at Thammasat. Uh, I saw uh, May, bloody May 1992. I was there, and I, I, in the event of uh, bloody uh, April and May 2010, I was still around, uh, but now retired. So I saw the four events of the contemporary history of Thailand, and I would say that these are two, two twins, you know. The first twin would be, uh, October 1473 with bloody May 1992. And as you know, you know, uh, the winners were the young people uh, and the middle class of Bangkok and the establishment, the winner of 1973 and May 1992. Uh, but for the uh, October 6, 1976, I would pair it with uh, April and uh, bloody April and May of 2010. These are, they are, you know, in some way, you know, rather similar. I, I love to say same, same, but different, you know, and like all the teachers. So uh, I have these two pairs and I think this is the kind of thing that I like to, to start with the uh, discussion or, or question, you know, that why uh, in 73 and 92, democratic leaning faction win, and why the 1976 and 2010 I would say that they are uh, democratic uh, 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 inclined, but they lost. That, that's the two things that I, I, I like to, to just to present it to you. Thank you. Just before we go on, could you um, give a little bit more information about Dr. Pui, because you mentioned the fact that you attended the meetings, and Dr. Pui was actually quite keen that the students shouldn't be on the campus and was trying to defuse that situation on the 5th uh, and he failed. Can you give us just a little bit of insight into that? Dr. Boy, Dr. Boy is a good mm, bureaucrat. Yeah. I, uh, we would say that Dr. Boy is a good amada. <laughs> <laughs> He's a long time uh, uh, governor, uh, Governor of the Bank of Thailand. Yeah. I think more than 10 years, you know, the longest in the history of Thailand. He's uh, very charming, you know. He one of the first uh, who admit that he's a, a Czech. He's a Sino Thai, you know. I mean, lot, most people, you know, uh, probably most Thai in this room, you know, have a uh, Chinese uh, background, but they don't want to say it. But Dr. Poi may be the first one who would come out as, of course, you know. Uh, I was poor, but I am a good student. I won scholarship. I, I study hard and all this, you know. So he's a man of 
I would say that Dr. Boy is a, like a, a man for all seasons. You know, I mean, now we are celebrating a hundred years of uh, Dr. Boy, and a lot of people try to to separate him from the event of October 6, 1976. That what a lot of people are trying to do to say that he doesn't have anything to do with uh, the the student or the 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 bad event. He is what what he was. Uh, Rector of Thomas Hall, only for two years, mm. you know, only for two years, and it's a difficult time. I worked with him only one year. He didn't know me, you know, because he's an economist, and usually economists wouldn't look at us, uh, his history student, you know, they look down on us, you know. I mean, <laughs> history is a <laughs> kind of <laughs> low grade, you know, in Thomas Hall and Chula. So, but he is somebody that you know, I was very surprised, you know, when I came back uh, from Ithaca and I, I gave a, a talk on my, I did a, a thesis on the rise of a UTR and I gave a talk on that and Dr. Boy came to listen. I mean, an, an economist coming to a history panel, which is rather odd, you know, very strange. So his, he is very inspiring. I mean, you, I mean, what, even if you are uh, quite right wing, you know, and if you are against uh, his ideology, but you can't help loving him. That's what happened to a lot of uh, my uh, fellow Thamasat, uh, Ajahn. A okay. lot of them are quite right wing, but they, they love Dr. Pui. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but anyway, Dr. Pui failed to, to head off what happened at uh, Thamasat as a rector. Uh, Ajahn Chowak, can you take us back to that day and your, your very intimate recollections of the period? Uh, thank you. Peace be with you. Uh, what I'll do is that I will take you back not to October 6th, but October 5th. And I'll take the cue from what Derek has said about uh, Bangkok and the fact that um, people across town didn't know what's going on on that very day. Actually, at Thammasat, there's a geography of Thammasat, and the football field is facing Sanam Luang. And in the back, uh, next to the Gongsei Data, the Council of State, uh, it's my faculty, Faculty of Political Science. And of all the faculty, I don't know whether Jan Chanwit would agree, but I think the Faculty of Political Science is perhaps the most, at that time, was perhaps the most conservative. It was associated with the Minister of Interior, and a lot of students, when they finish, they would like to continue in the bureaucracy that was the Minister of Interior. What happened then is that, I think, if you look at the geography of Thammasat at the time, uh, the Faculty of Political Science was almost untouched by the, the violence, the atrocity that took place in the football field. So we are talking about how large is that? How large is Tamasa? 50 right? 50 right? About, about 20 acres or something like that. And I think political science has not been violated as the rest of the, the space that was Tamasa University that was violated. And I, you know, there's a, there's a difference there uh, uh, that within the Tamasa itself. The second thing is that the next day after October 6, what I recall is that I had to sit with my mom and burning some of the small books that we had. And I don't think I was alone in that kind of activities because at the time, uh, Tamasa students have become demonized, uh, have become targets. Um, dehumanized in, in one more ways than one. Now I fast forward uh, that incident and I would put before you that October 6 by any measure is what some theorists would call a transformative event or transforming event. There's a lot, uh, if you look at the life of society, there's certain events that when it erupts or takes place, it changes the course of that society. And in some ways, I think October 6th has done that.
has done that to many individuals, has done that to a generation, and has done that in some ways to Thai society. To me personally, I must say that when I left Thammasat in 1977 to pursue my graduate study at the University of Hawaii, if it was not for, th for October 6, 1976, I would not have ventured into the, the area of studies that I have done. I went into the study of violence and nonviolence because, I can say, because of October 6, 1976. I wrote my dissertation not on the incident. I did something that both historians might not uh, might frown upon because this is political theory. But it's inter my interest is in that field since then. And I returned, and I'm, I have been working on the subject of violence and nonviolence ever since. And I would say that for many of my generations, there are people who look at October 6 as, as an wound as what Pong Chai would later call traumatic history. And that also shaped their lives. And I would say that the proliferation of so many institutes, studies, practices, interested in peaceful resolution and whatnot that has been taking place all over Thailand, you know, at least in names, if not in practices, I think owe a lot to this incident. Because this is something now, this is a transforming event, but it's something else. To me, this is what I would call extreme violence. What that means is that it shatters all kinds of regulated relationship practices that was there. And it looks at the people on the other side, not as people anymore. A proper term might be a massacre. Massacre, as you all know, was used in the past in Europe when they dealt with animals. And, th and that is what has taken place. So as a result of a society that pride itself as a Buddhist, as a peace-loving, as all kinds of things, if people ask me if there's anything that Thai society excels about, I think we excel at the art of delusion, particularly self-delusion. And if that is the case, then what happens is that we have to try to do something with this thing that has taken place in our life history of a society. And one way that Thai society has dealt with is silence. It's silence because the history of October 6, in a way, is dangerous history. And so we dealt with it in silence. We all, all but erase it from you know, our consciousness or study or what have you, except for those who live through it. And if anything, I think October 6 has a right to. It has a right to memory of people. There's a need to retain the right to memory so that Thai society will be allowed to look at itself in reality, in truth. I must also say that after the 40th anniversary um, commemorative event at Tamasat, I asked some of my students at Tamasat these days, uh, Ajahn Shanvit was my history professor at the time. But Tamasa students this day, I look at my students, about 80, 90 of them, only one went to the, um, the event. I asked the rest what happened to them. And they said that somehow they don't feel connected with the October 6th. 1976, you are looking at Tamasat with about 9,000 students. 2016, you are looking at Tamasat with 30,000 students. You are looking at Thai society that has changed dramatically. What I have to do these days is try to find a language that I could speak to them in a way that would make sense of what has transpired in our own society. It's not easy. And with that, I think there's a need that we come to he come here tonight and to talk about this uh, October 6, 1976 as a transforming event in the life of Thai society. It has a right to the memory of this society. And I'm pleased that we are able to do it at this time. Thanks.
Just before I go to Professor Tongchai, um, Ajahn Chai Wai, you spoke about the nature of the killing at Tamasa. In terms of, of volumes, we can all aggregate things. Uh, Tamasa 76 is maybe not the worst in terms of, of the death toll, but there's, there was another aspect of it that you mentioned uh, when we had a conversation. Could you share that with the audience? Yeah, if you look at uh, this kind of what some scholars would call extreme violence, uh, when done, you know, uh, in broad daylight, in done in uh, that kind of, uh, you know, the, the iconic uh, photograph that you were talking about, the chair, the burning of all this, uh, what happened is that it shatters the myth about, uh, about a society that we feel that we need to preserve it. And therefore, it creates all kinds of, of rupture within. Uh, the extreme violence that has taken place was unprecedented. It, you know, I, we talked about this earlier, uh, not this year, many years before, but, but the thing that disturbed me the most was not someone hitting the other with a chair, but the onlookers and the smile on their face. And that, I feel, I cannot tolerate because that speaks volume about this society and the way in which it grows up to accept this kind of things that can be done against you know, a human being. And, and that is something that has not taken place before. Yes, there are fighting in the streets in 2010. Yes, in 1992. But this, this is a massacre. This is something else. And this was done by, by it, I cannot say ordinary people, but it's the ordinary people that means a lot in this whole atrocity. Mm -hmm. And that makes it special. Right. So Ajahn Tongchai, what, what still needs to be said uh, about Thomas Art 76? What still needs to be said? Uh, almost the whole thing, maybe. <laughs> I think my job here today, I'm not going to talk about what happened that day because I assume that most of you here, you have read, you have seen, you have heard what happened. And I have talked to, this year alone, I have talked to a number of presses about this event already. BBC Witness Program, their primary task just asked me to, to, to tell them what happened. That's the primary task. Th anything else, comments, interpretation is secondary. They want me to say what happened. I, I haven't watched it. Uh, they sent a link to me. I haven't watched it because I, 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 may, I maybe I won't watch it. But I believe that many of you have seen it already. I have to talk to AP. I have to talk to a number of uh, other places. So let's say I will skip this part. If you have any question, if anything you'd like to know and I happen to be able to explain, I can, I can answer later. What still need to be said is that at least for the first 20 years, we haven't talked much about it at all. For the past 20 years, we have talked about it a lot in Thai society. In fact, we have talked about it a lot. But we have talked about it a lot, but little has been said. We talk about October 6 as violence, brutality, massacre. Then we have talked about it again, violence, brutality, massacre. Then we have to talk about it again, violence, brutality, massacre. That's how we talk. October 6 has been said in the past 20 years in a way very, very little, even though it's not silence anymore. I call it the other way, it's a partial silence. We can talk about it now in the sense that there was brutality, unbelievable violence going on, I mean, took place on that day, and don't let it happen. Thai society talked exactly these two sentences and then full stop. What happened? Who did it? Why it happened? How to stop it? 
what the lessons? No, we haven't talked much about that at all. I'm not sure maybe the faults of historians, or maybe historians know what, what we are supposed to say more, but we can't say it. The half silence is just, we can say a lot loudly that October 6th must not happen again. But we haven't talked much about it at all. What happened, not in terms of what actually happened, but in terms of what does it mean? What leads to it? What's the role of the media? What's the role of palace? What's the role of military, the police, blah, 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 and ordinary people? We haven't talked much about that. So I'm not sure. It's half, si it's, a, it's half silence, and so half of the things supposed to be said have been said, or that, or the silence is more than half. I, I don't know how to measure. October 6th, I like what Derek said about the, that this is the end of, of, of SMI, right? Land of SMI. I think October 6th represents everything opposite the Thai SMI. It represents uh, everything opposite what we ordinary, what we commonly assume, presumably call it the tiniest. It doesn't fit the general reputation of what Thailand is. It doesn't fit the general reputation or the expectation what the military is supposed to do, police is supposed to do, the Sangha is supposed to do, and the palace was supposed to do. It's the opposite all of that. That's the reason we can't say much. I like what the Chan Chiu said a moment ago. It's a transformative event that, that changed a lot of people. Not only your dissertation. My history of geography is, in fact, is about October 6th. You can find out what many steps or how many turns it takes to get from a massacre to a map. In the past week alone, after the commemorative event in Tamasat, I got email from quite a few people. One of them just this mo just yesterday and this morning. Uh, a lady live in the U.S. Told me that her sister. Was, part, was with me at Tamasa 40 years ago. I don't know, I don't remember her. She told me the name. She told me that, and then her sister went to jungle. Of course, you know what happened after that. All fell, come back, disillusioned, and she blamed herself for leaving the family and went to the jungle. Only the only the only thing the first the late, the first one who is a younger sister knows about her older sister is that is that all she was in Tamasa forty years ago on October sixth she went to Janko she came back and her sister never talked about it again it becomes a taboo in her family she wrote to me yesterday she 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 read the she. I think she watched BBC and read Bangkok Post. I, I don't remember the details. Then she sent the link to her sister. Then she got the news this morning and she relayed the news to me. It's the first time her, her elder sister talked to her about October 6th. That's all she told me and that's all I think you need to know. It's a, it's a trauma, it's transformative in many ways, and many people deal with it differently. I would not deny that. I would not say that dealing with it in one, from A to Z, 26 ways or more than that, anyone is right, anyone is wrong. People deal with it differently. For uh, the example of that, that uh, the, the two sisters, it's just one of them, one and, 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 and what happened in details, I, I don't think I'd like to know. I, I think it's, that's a wonderful, that's a beautiful enough story that finally you talk to one another. October 6th is painful because it's opposite. Everything Thai society is supposed to stand for or we are taught, we, we expect Thai society to be, 
and everything and many things many people expect from Thai society then they didn't get I'm not even sure that it's okay if you give me like too much time I can explain to you what I expect what is the problem but for other people like the, the ladies I just mentioned I'm not sure I can't, exp I, I, can't, I can't explain what, what's going on in their mind, but I think it's too painful to her, partly because it's beyond her ability to describe easily. So the, the, the easier way is to, 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 to go to silence. Next point, why October 6th with uh, low casualty? Lower in Thai scale, only half of 73, half of, of 92, and all half, I mean nearly half of 73, nearly half of the, uh, no, it's not nearly half, sorry, more than, a little more than half of 73 and 92, and only half of 2010. What distinctive about October 6 is brutality, extreme violence. Extreme violence on that day means what? Let I try to put it in uh, simplistically in this way. If you were killed by getting shot, if you call that dehumanized, that's humanized level one. It's normal. You are enemy. You're supposed to be killed. The fact that the bodies of those who die were, how to say, were abused. I don't know the, I can't remember, I can't think what, what's the word, just, I can't, it humiliated, yep. The way they were humiliated, not only it, not only did it mean that they were not human, dehumanized to another level, one notch, but they were dehumanized in such a way, maybe, okay, I say it again. The way the body were, de were humiliated, we can say that not only dehumanization, but demonization going on. They were turned not only non-human, but a devil. Have you seen the picture where they put the stake on their chest and try to put the stake, I mean, into the body of the dead? That means that the guy who did that must have seen Western movie. That's the, that's the way you did, I mean, you're supposed to do to, with Satan, right? So he, not only he's de the, the victim was dehumanized, but he's Satan. The w and many other ways, such as hanging, burning, uh, even a boy, I mean, peeing on the, the, a dead body. The way they did to the dead is one, I mean, is one level more or level lower, what it depends on what you say, but more than or lower than typical dehumanization. And the third level, which never happened, the second and third level never happened in other killing in Thailand, like Dan Chaba said. The third level is the onlookers, ordinary people, can laugh, or put it the other way around. The killing the, and the humiliation of the body took place in public. What is that? Is it a very medieval way of punishment? Yes, Thai way too. The old traditional Thai way of punishment is to bring the criminal humiliated them in public. So if we shot dead on that day, October 6th would not be so traumatic. But the way the body were humiliated and the way they were put on display for public spectacle, it means much more than normal killing. The dehumanization, I don't know the word. I think we have to say it, have, I, I can't, I don't know the, what the exact word. We need to think about dehumanization times two or times three. Uh, one more thing about October 6th, the silence that Ajahn Chavat talked about, the injustice that happened, 
chose as the way the Thai society deal with the past atrocity and deal with atrocity. Just enough. I think I don't need to explain more than this because uh, October 6th, there was never an investigation even right after the incident. No investigation. And then the amnesty bill that released my group, I mean 19 students, including me, two years later. The reason, uh, the rationale for the amnesty bill is because we are young people, we are ignorant when we did the mis when we made the mistake. So they should, uh, the bill said they should absolve, the bill would absolve, nobody did anything wrong on that day. The rationale, the official rationale of the bill written down as the preamble of the bill is to forgive us because we are so young, we are ignorant. But we all know that the beneficiary, the person who, the people who got benefit from that bill is actually all of those other people who committed the crime on that day. That's way to close the door for justice forever. A lot, I mean, so that it, October 6th represents the opposite of tightness. The brutality is an extreme dehumanization to a three level, and the silence and the partial silence after 20 years and after 40 years, the, that tells us about Thai society, how it deals with atrocity, how it deals with injustice. A lot of things, next point I want to say is a lot of things are still unknown, are still uh, little known, are still misunderstood. Let me clarify a few facts to you. There were five people hanged, not one, not two, five. Two of them, we don't know yet who they were. Neil, nice to see you today. The victim in your picture is still unknown. I thought that I know that. I thought I know that we met you a month ago. I just learned in the past month that I was wrong. We still don't know who the victim was. Among the five, four of them likely dead when they were hanged. The way we look at this, because if you are hanged and your, your tongue stick up, it means that you're still alive and hang until you die. Four bodies were hanged without the tongue sticking out. One body, the student from Chulalongkorn University, he was hanged to death. Three bodies found in the police uh, custody in the autopsy report still unknown who they are. And four burnt bodies still unknown, unidentified even what genders they are. These are simple facts. Simple, I mean, I don't mean that easy, I don't mean that unimportant, but it's a primary fact we should know, we're supposed to know. Nobody cares, nobody dig it up enough who they are. Then, there's no need, I mean, sorry, not no need. Beyond that, so much to talk about, such as what's the role of Red Gore, I'm not sure the Red will play the primary role in that day. They play some roles, of course. They must be responsible. But there are right wing, I call it vigilante. Right wing vigilante in that group, which organized by ISOC, not the Red Gores. Mm -hmm. I interviewed them, I talked to them. They were the ones who said proudly that they did it. The group organized later uh, later, the group later has a name in 1981. They had the name as Apirak Chakri, protector of the Chakri dynasty. The reason because they have the office in the, in the palace compound for a few years. 
they were kicked out a few years later uh, after that. But that group, not the Red Girl. At least, I'm not sure Red Girl might, might be play some role, but at least that group were the one who said that they did it. They were certainly inspired by somebody. <laughs> by somebody who is the reason we can't talk much. Uh, a lot more misunderstood, a lot more unknown, such as we talk about right wing. It's may, it may be impossible, but, but it's, it is possible to know more than we know right now. More than we know right now. But it, it may be impossible to reach, a, the, I mean, maybe it's impossible to know everything. Maybe it's impossible who, who to know who, who gives the order. Maybe it's impossible who, whether those kind of ugly action, humiliation to those body, are those planned, assigned, by design, or out of control. I'm not sure we can know even the answer of those uh, 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 things. Anyway, one more point. Keep in mind that October 6 was not the first case of serious crime that up to now, how to say? That the perpetrators got impunity. The point is that October 6 is sometimes is emphasized as it is justice hasn't been served. I don't mean to be little or to minimize its importance that the uh, uh, injustice is still, I mean, prevail in, in October 6 case. But I'd like to, to, to remind people that it's not the only case. There are many other cases, from small to big ones. Again, this is not to minimize, it's not to belittle it, but let's say the point is to emphasize that impunity has been part of the state formation in Thailand. Impunity has been pretty much part of important turning point in modern Thai history. What happened in 1946? Has justice been served? After three scapegoats was, was executed, 10 years after that, the perpetrator is still alive. What about 1992? What about 2010? Those are major turning point in modern Thai history. Not every major turning point in modern Thai history involves impunity, but too many of them, too many of them involve crimes committed by somebody or many people, yet they were protected and impunity were granted. My last point, by the same token, I don't think October 6th is the last case that justice disappears. October 6th is not the last case. We have seen too many. History will tell if 2010 will be like October 6th, that like a Chan Chavi said, but in some ways, uh, it started to show some signs they are similar. For example, relative of the victim of the 1973 and 1992, they can organize. There was some kind of commemoration that the state accept or recognize and participated, such as in two days, October 14, if nothing happened between now and October 14, there will be a commemoration of the October 14, presided by Prime Minister, House Speaker, or their, uh, or their, or their, or their representative. 1992, there were partial recognition by the state. October 6, no. We have reached out to about a dozen of relatives of the victims. All, so far, all but two. All but two beg us, ask us not, they don't want to come up in public. 
they don't want to come out in public. They wouldn't want the public to know them because they know that October, October 6th is too sensitive. I believe that 2010 would face similar situation. The relative would not come forward because 2010 is still too fresh and perhaps in 10 years, 20 years from now, it could be still too sensitive. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dominic, can I just raise a point? There's uh, probably a lot of people in this room don't know that there was a coup on the night of October the 6th mm. and that a government was installed led by Tynan Krivitian, which was probably the most severely right-wing government this country's had. And there were book burning. At they <coughs> soldiers were going into the bookstore at Shula University and burning books. It, it was really uh, uh, old-time anti anti-student, anti-communist, whatever you want. Uh, it, was, it was antiquated revenge. And that went on for a year before Tainan was removed. But it was, uh, it's probably something that is, is uh, I just wanted to include that as part of this history because I think it was very important. Yeah. Right, well, we have uh, a microphone in the middle of the room for anybody who'd like to ask a question. Uh, I mean, the there seems to be a sort of slightly stunned silence. Stunned silence with me. You should be so lucky. Um, Michael Mackey, just a, a comparative question. Um, were the mobs that moved into Tamasat, what was their motivation? And a question that I'd be surprised if anyone could answer, really, but I wouldn't mind somebody's insight on it. Was the desecration of the bodies, as uh, Professor Ajahn Chanchai has outlined, was it, do you think it was deliberate, it was premeditated, that this was something that people were deliberately mobilized to do, or was it a index of the hysteria that was going on at the time. Um, and the other question that I have is a broader question about this. Put 76 in a broader context. Um, you have the collapse of Laos, you have the collapse of Vietnam, Cambodia. Were people at that point, I was only born in 1963, so I can't remember much about 1976, and as I was living in England at the time, the details of Thai politics have escaped me. Was there a hysteria about what was happening on the border? Is there any way that the right can justify what it was doing on those grounds, that a line had to be drawn somewhere? Or was this more than that? Thank you. Who wants to answer that? Maybe I start. Uh, number one, why I moved to Tamasa briefly, because we think Tamasa is the safest place. With the kind of vigilant, with the kind of attacks in the small scale before that, we demonstrated in Sanam Luang open space. It's so easy to get under attack. Tamasa is safer. We did not anticipate a massacre. In our imagination, believe or not, up to you, but in our imagination on that day, we still, the only thing we read about massacre is hap it, it, the incident in South Korea, incident somewhere else, which we read through, we didn't even see the pictures. We didn't imagine the police, the soldiers would come and surround it and use heavy weapon against us. Tamasa, in fact, is a safe place because it has big buildings around us. The Red Ghost, other can throw plastic bombs, can use handguns, 
it's it's we protect ourselves better with that, better than Sanam Luang. We did not expect the police to surround us. Once the police did that, we locked ourselves up inside Tamasa. We can't go anywhere. It's true. It's wrong decision in by the hit hindsight. But because at the time a massacre was still unthinkable. I, I that number two, the desecration. Uh, thanks, by the way. I, I, I tried to think about the term. I got the term from you. Desecration of the bodies, deliberate or not, or hysteria. That's, that's exactly what I said at the end uh, a moment ago. We don't know. And I'm not sure we can know. There are some some evidence or some information suggests that it could be deliberate, but it's in inconclusive. It's so inconclusive, and we don't jump to this easily, right? So uh, it could be a mix of both as well. <laughs> Number three is 76. Yes, I think they scare. I mean, the right wing, the establishment, they scare. Not only the communists took place on the border, suddenly they saw the right left wing, saw the radical students' movement. Uh-oh, the communists inside the backyard. In a way, I think they'll believe that. Was that a good justification, enough justification for killing us? That's a different story. I, I, I was, you were talking about the desecration of the bodies. Uh, there's an Indonesian word a mark. And I have been chased by Indonesian students <laughs> when they're a mark. And this crowd was exactly that. They were, it was mindless violence. They were pursuing it. They didn't care who watched, what they were doing. So it, it's, I don't think there was any forethought given to this. They were just, they were just zoned out. Also, also fit in, uh, there was a pattern of uh, demonization of the students and uh, identifying them with Vietnamese. Uh, in late 75, uh, there were attacks on Vietnamese communities uh, along the Mekong, uh, one of them led by, by the then Nong Thai uh, governor. Uh, there were giant posters uh, showing uh, a map <coughs> of, of Indochina and Thailand where Indochina was a, a uh, Vietnamese person uh, gobbling up Thailand. Mm. Um, in January, General Sangat warned that, I forget the number, 109, 112 female Vietnamese satyrs had infiltrated <coughs> Thailand uh, and kept leading up to this. And Yang Kro, the, uh, the armored radio station uh, was saying the days before that there were 2,000 Vietnamese inside Thammasat and the students were Vietnamese and, and all patriots come and kill the Vietnamese. And eating dogs. Isn't that one of the rumors that was spread? Well, we moved here in 1976. My wife is Vietnamese. And whenever a taxi driver asked, where are you from? She would say Malaysia. <laughs> Until just this past week, we got in the taxi, and the taxi driver said, where are you from? And she proudly said, Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> right, question, please. Um, hi, I'm from Prachatai English, and my question is primarily for Ajahn Tonchai. I was wondering if you could evaluate specifically um, this year's commemorative events held at Tamasat University and Jula, particularly um, kinds of reflecting upon some of your past writing that has um, described some of the struggles commemorative events have faced in terms of finding um, like fundamental language to kind of even conceptualize like the unspeakable event that was 6th of October. I'm thinking of like remembering um, slash silencing the traumatic past, your paper. I was wondering whether you found this year's events to offer anything new in terms of asking new questions, whether they offered a new approach to remembrance at all, or whether it was just same old, same old? Maybe, I think right now, I think it's still the same, but maybe I need more time. 
not only me, maybe we need more time to reflect on what happened it just last week. So maybe I, I think give me some more time, maybe I, I'm wrong, but immediate response to right now, I think uh, more people learn about it, but in general, in the big picture, it hasn't changed much. On that question, I, I like to chip in a little bit because um, perhaps by connecting what has transpired in October 6th and the memory of October 6th, by inviting someone like uh, Jojo Wong to come, it connects the particular with a larger pattern. And then uh, also, you know, you had that at July. On one hand, you know, the newspaper came out and talked a lot about that case. And people feel that it eclipsed what has uh, happened at Tamasad, but I feel that maybe this is, a, this is an ex extension of the same kind of uh, interest that we had towards uh, resistance or uh, efforts by people to fight against injustice. But in that sense, it's quite interesting to look at how October 6th has expanded. Question? Uh, I'm Paul Waddell. I'm a retired journalist and uh, writer. I was wondering if uh, particularly the historians on the panel could identify some of the common denominators between many of the traumatic events in Thailand, whether we're talking about the abortive 1912 revolt, the 1932 change in government, the coups in the 1950s, uh, then of course October 14th, October 6th, 1992, and then the ones we've seen most recently. What are the common denominators that uh, lead to these continuing conflicts that never seem to result in a resolution in a way forward. Who would like to tackle? Well, if you look back, you know, like 50 years, 70 years, 80 years, I think there's a kind of pattern, you know. And I actually I am I'm writing I think it's my last book, <laughs> Thailand, A Struggle for a Nation. I think we are struggling to be a nation. And it's something that I, I guess, you know, I, 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 I guess uh, to talk about this in English is possible. I, I do not want to talk it in Thai. But I am seeing what's happening now is a kind of similarity of the sort of last years of the fifth reign and the present one. I am doing some kind of comparative studies of the last 10 years of King Chulalongkorn and the present reign. It seems to be rather similar. And my idea is that from now on, which is now on, there'll be a big, big change. And if you compare the two reigns, you know, King Chulalongkorn, who constructed absolute monarchy, his absolute monarchy lasted only from 1910 to 1932, meaning 22 years. I mean, King Chulalongkorn constructed an immense barami, you know, his 42 year reign. He's one of, I mean, very revered and all this, you know. But his barami cannot be passed to his sons, King Rama the Sixth and the Seventh. If you, you look back, you know. So, I mean, if you go uh, according to Theravada Buddhism, we have two words meaning power. You know, we have two words. What the first word would be Amnat, and the, the other one is Barami. Barami is, you know, Kun Anand Panjarachun would translate it as a reserve power. It's some kind that you have to 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 construct it. You have to, to make it up. 
it's, it doesn't mean that if you have gun or tanks, you can have barami. You have guns and tanks, you can have amnat, but you do not have barami. And barami is something that you have to, to construct it on your own. And barami in Theravada Buddhism cannot be passed down. One has to construct oneself. So this is what I am seeing is that what we are, we've been witnessing you know, for the last, what, uh, half a century, probably, you know, is a kind of new monarchy of present-day Thailand. Siam has absolute monarchy. Thailand has new monarchy. And I think this is a kind of what we are witnessing. I always like to, to tell my friends in Facebook that if you want to know what's going to happen in our poor country, Thailand, you read Lamen of Si Ayutthaya, Preng Yao Phayakorn Kung Si Ayutthaya. It's very, very similar to what the Burmese have on their mural painting in their literature and all this, you know, it's supposed to be a kind of uh, omen from the Lord Buddha. But ac actually it's talk about present day Thailand and present day Burma. Burma seems to, to have passed over, but we stuck. Can I just ask uh, you, uh, the historians, um, who, who do you write for? Who, who reads what you write? What is the appetite for truth in Thailand? <laughs> Up to you, because you may have one answer, I have a different answer. Tong Chai wrote uh, Sai M map. Yeah? Yeah. To get a PhD, <laughs> and his audience is uh, English English speaking. Yeah, you were talking about the, the the Vietnamese eating up the map of Thailand. That's actually cover of Tong Chai uh, book. So I guess you know, in a time like this, you know, it's you have to do a, a kind of uh, what you call boomerang. Uh. You do it in English, and then it bounces back. Tong Chai took 40 years yeah, to come over to talk a lot uh, this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what's what very interesting is that this, you know, uh, let, let me add to this. I, I look at uh, the, the four events, you know, and I, I pair uh, October 1473 with uh, May 1992. Huh? And then the second one, second twin would be uh, October 6, uh, 76 with uh, April, May uh, 2010. Uh, I myself, you know, I, I do not want to write about October 6 at all. I saw the whole thing, you know. I mean, you know, you know, Tong Chai and me and some of my friends, uh, we are old boys from the same school, you know, and all this, you know. I mean, Thailand is like this, you know, I mean, all the the elite uh, go to the same school and same faculty. <laughs> Actually, I was at political science that Chai Wat said, uh, very conservative. I don't agree with you, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> political science produced somebody like Kassian and Sexan, you know. They got corrupted by Cornell. <laughs> 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 well, I, I didn't want to talk about October 6th at all. You know, the only thing I did about October 6th, even though I saw it, is to do the translation of withdraw Withdrawal of Symptom by Benedict Anderson. And it, it, you know, we have translated it into Thai and it's reprinted right now, you know, with a long introduction by Niti, by Gassian, by Tanet and me. So uh, that's what I did. I didn't want to, 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 to do October 6th. And then I asked myself, you know, later on, why d I didn't want to do it. I found out now, you know, I have the same problem with uh, uh, like most people. I do not want to talk about the loser. I want to talk about the winner. So I mean, October 14, the winner, 
uh, Bradley May 1992, the winner. But, you know, October 6th, the, the loser, and uh, uh, 2010, also the loser. So, but now, you know, I mean, to, to not to be so, so pessimistic, you know, I, I think 40 years have passed, and I think we talk more now. We talk a lot more now. I, I feel rather free, you know, to, to talk now. Of course, you know, I have to use some kind of symbolism and all this, you know, but I think we are more free uh, to talk and a lot of things are coming out, especially in the uh, internet and the social media. Tong Chai said that he got uh, email from this, from that. I also got the same thing. Even the daughter of the policeman who do, did the, sh the shooting, she was a student at Thomas. <laughs> the daughter, you know, meaning uh, th uh, 30 years uh, have passed. She came to Thammasai and she said, every year people condemn her father. And she ex tried to explain it, you know. Oh, I mean, she didn't know what happening because she was not born yet, you know, at that time. But this is something that a lot of things coming out uh, right now, which is a good sign. Uh, I, I believe that, you know, if we don't learn history, we, we repeat it. We repeat it in uh, 1992 because we, do, we, didn't, we have not learned about uh, October 6, 76. And yep. the, the okay. same thing might be happening again because only maybe in, in this room, I don't, that's all. But outside, I don't think they, they learn about it. It's not in history book. Right. Tong Chai's book cannot be sold in the market. <laughs> uh, I think in Thailand, People have started talking about it to some extent, as I said. October 6 is brutal, violent, it's not good, don't let it happen again, but not much. Uh, partly, I didn't start talking this year, I started talking about 20 years ago, but let's say not many people. This time, uh, one factor which is different from 20 years ago is social media, of course. Uh, I don't know who I write history, I mean, when I write history, I didn't think about the audience. I, I don't know, in, my, in a way I think, I never think about the audience. I think what I want to write. Right. By the way, I'd like to tell Paul, your question, good, very good question, don't have answer. But if you ask, I mean the question about common denominator of those events. If you ask Federico Ferraro, Ferrari or Ferraro? In uh, Ho uh, Hong Kong. Uh, he would say, the common de denominator is an unfinished struggle for popular sovereignty. Full stop. Question. Yes, a Kirk Person Club member. Uh, my question is for Ajahn Tongchai. Um, after those events, when you and the, the 18 were in prison, what was that experience like for you? How did you process this traumatic experience you had all been through? Were you able to talk with your, your fellow students while in prison? Did you write? How did you process this traumatic experience? I don't know. I don't know. I only know that some of my friends, at least one come to my mind right away, I don't tell you who, among the 18, I don't think he ever recovered from that incident, okay? Beyond those 18, 19 people, at least the lady I mentioned, she has not recovered or let's say she still pain mm -hmm. until, at least until now, and I don't think the fact that she can talk to her younger sister means the pain was over. It just, it's just different, but I don't think it's over. Do I know people who until today never want to talk, never come, never show up at the commemoration? Yes, I know at least a number of them in my head right now. Everybody deal with the past differently. How do I turn around? I don't know, I gave interview to the same question from Achara from Back of Post. I, my answer is the same, I don't know. I just know that at a certain point, I, I didn't have anger, I didn't have revenge. And, but it doesn't mean that I forgive, like many journalists asked me 20 years ago, have I forgiven, have I forgiven? 
I find that those questions in Thailand, they don't feel strange. Don't you think among the non-Thai, among the Farang here, would you think it's strange that many journalists in Thailand kept asking me 20 years ago, have I forgiven? They never say forgiven to whom? Because in Buddhist thinking, we can forgive without the perpetrators. We can forgive without the people to be forgiven. But I think for many other culture, many other, it is strange. So somehow at least, I don't feel like I need revenge. I'm not sure is that forgiving. I'm not sure. I just want to know what happened. Like I like to see the guy who hold the chair. I want to meet him. And the other day, one, one, one uh, uh, I mean, I was asked, if you met, if I even meet him, what would I ask him? What would I like to know? I just want to know his story. Whatever he can tell, can tell me, what, have, what did you do in that, that day? Why did you do that? And I wouldn't even challenge. Let him, can let him speak. I want to know that. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I have been through those uh, phases. Of course, I can talk to the Red Ghost. I can talk to General Utan Sanit Wong, who commands the, the, the armor radio station. I talked to him in 2000. I don't remember, 2001 or 2002. Uh, yeah, I have gone, but I don't know how. I, my answer to Bangkok Post, in short, I believe I turn it to kind of rational inquiry. But is that the right answer? I'm not sure. Only thing I know that October 6th is in my mind. It inspired me. I turned it into inspiration to do a number of things. But how do I get to that point? I don't know. Then how about other people? People deal with it differently. But I, was, I was asking specifically about during your time in prison, what was going through your mind and people's minds? Did we do the right thing? Should what we have done differently? How was that? You know, you'd hear of you know Martin Luther King Jr. or Mandela in prison. What was that experience like for you as you? Were if I know, I can write books too. <laughs> I don't think I know. And keep in mind that when I was in jail, we are young. I'm not even sure. We may be too young. We may be too young to understand. If I were in jail, when I have kids, it could have been so different. I had two people in there have families, have kids. They, are, they have different experience from young people like me. So I, I wouldn't guess. I, wouldn't, I, I, I don't want to guess. I don't want to say that among the people who are students, we get beyond this kind of trauma in jail. I am not sure. Question. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a member of the club. Um, I think that there was a moment in history where um, there is a potential time for investigation or opening of 6 October in terms of both uh, um, the substantive investigation as well as truth finding was, I think, when um, key members of the October generation were in Thaksin's administration. Like we had the like of Pum Tham Wechayachai, Sutam Sang Patum, and Jatulon Chai Sang in, in Thaksin's government. Mm. I, I was wondering, um, were there some sort of discussion at the time in terms of uh, with um, um, the, the victims of October um, 6, 1976, with, with those um, individuals? And my second question is that. Um, as a Thammasat alumni, uh, when, when, when I was studying at Thammasat, um, there were a lot of uh, discussion that um, the 6 October, unlike 14 October, um, there were opposition in terms of bringing the monument of 6 October to the public sphere. Like in 14 October, we have a monument on Ratchadam uh, Nern Road. Um, I would like to ask, um, question to maybe Ajahn Chanwit and Ajahn Tong Chai uh, to clarify this, was there opposition in terms of trying to place the October 6th monument outside Thammasat? 
Right, so that was the opportunity to look at the documents, the official documents in the Thaksin period, the window. The answer for that is simple, no. Right. <laughs> and on the monument? For the monument, uh, maybe, can I ask the journalist uh, what's your answer? Well, yeah, you can, because I wrote about the silence of the monument. <laughs> I, I, if you listen to Ajahn Chanwit's narrative, then uh, October 6th and May 2010 are stories of defeat. And I think, I don't know whether I'm right, or this has to defer to Ajahn Chanwit. I think after October 6th, within the administrators of Thammasat, there's some kind of a, of a psyche that some of them maybe want to distance themselves from the memory of October 6th. And they try to align themselves with, with something else uh, at the expense of, you know, the sometimes the tradition of Thammasat itself. And therefore, to use uh, Tong Chai's, uh, I think, brilliant way of anal uh, an analysis, uh, it doesn't fit October 6. It caused so much imbalance, trauma, uh, that I, if, you, if you, you know, put it there, uh, it disrupts the whole story that the new people at Tamasad want to tell. Right, question. Dr. Tong Shakap, I've been in, in Tamasat on Thursday listening to you in the auditorium. And I remember at the end that you and the singer of the group of musicians and the public were singing a song full of dignity, of sadness, and of hope, and maybe unity. Could you tell us about this song? It was 6 o'clock in the evening, just after your lecture on Thursday, in yeah. Tamasat, great auditorium. Yeah. You remember? This is the song that was sung. The song that you oh. sang. Without music. Song a cappella. You know, uh, the question, I mean, you asked me to explain about the song? Yes, what's the meaning? It was oh. very fine, very nice. <laughs> Which one? Sing it. The singing after after, after my your talk lecture, it was seven. After, right? After, okay, yes. Okay. Every, okay. Everybody's standing up. Yeah. You remember? Yeah, and and part of it, uh, part of it is lyric. I took the title of my talk. Let's say I took the title of my talk on that day was part of a censor of its lyric. Mm -hmm. Okay, the song. I'm I'm not a music person, dude. I can't even song, I can't even sing. Uh, it was written by Tipumisa. Many of you must have heard. I am sorry, by who? Tipumisa, uh, who was arrested in Baisalit regime in 1957, mm -hmm. stayed in jail for uh, eight years. He was a radical intellectual of that generation and then was put in jail because of communist charge. After release in 1965, right? Yeah, I think 65, he joined the Communist Party. And then a year later, he was killed uh, as a guerrilla fighter. But he wrote, he composed that song while he was in jail. The meaning of the song is simple, Sim not simple, simply we kind of, uh, the, the, the trans literal translation is a uh, is a star light of faith, light of faith. Uh, the song can be understood literally just as we must have hope, we must endure, we must persevere despite our difficulties and then we will like a rise above the challenge, that kind of thing. Or you can read it in CPT's view the stars mean the Communist Party, the faith mean faith in the party, depends on who you are. <laughs> Long life to Thailand, Doctor. Thank you. But I'd just like to ask one, one final question. When you, when you look back, you, we talk about Thai uh, uniqueness, Thai-ness and everything like that. When you look at uh, what happened at Tamasat in 76, 
Do you feel that the conspiracy of silence that followed it is actually any worse here than in other countries? I mean, if you look at silence, silence the, the half-truth that you were discussing, you know, if you look at Indonesia, uh, Sukarno, uh, that takeover, a massacre, Rangoon, 88, a massacre, Tiananmen, there are lots of horrendous things that happen in the world. Is Thailand actually any more deficient in dealing with these problems than other places? Look at Bloody Sunday in Northern I Ireland. I, I like to uh, uh, answer to that. Benedict Anderson at one time, you know, talk about the radicals of Thailand. Uh, look at Sekhan, who, who became his student at Cornell too. Look at Tong Chai, who became student of uh, Craig Reynolds at, at uh, Sydney. Yeah? Uh, so he talked about, he talked to these people uh, when they complain about this and that, you know. He said, don't complain. If you look at, at all those victims in Indonesia, you wouldn't be <laughs> this far. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, you don't have the kind of people who've been to the jungle and then uh, uh, gone over to Cornell and came, uh, came back to be dean of uh, fac uh, the faculty of uh, political science like Sikh San. I look, look at all this. So, I mean, comparatively, you know, I, I would say that even though we complain a lot about Thailand, uh, but comparatively, it's not that bad. If you if you look at Indonesia, what the the, the movie about the silence, you know, Kun uh, uh, the one that we saw uh, about killing. Indonesia, the the yeah, that's the one. Yeah, at the end, uh, the killers went up to the mountain and they sing "Born Free." <laughs> I mean, after killing all the uh, a million of people in Indonesia. So in a way, uh, I would say that even though I don't feel happy with my country, you know, uh, as of now, but when you look at it, uh, 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 last week I came here and uh, Jonathan Head was here. And you know, Jonathan Head, he, he's quite good, you know. He got me talking a lot, a, a lot of things I wouldn't want to talk. But <laughs> <laughs> at the end, you know, I, I found myself telling him that because of the brutality of October 6, 1976, you know, I was so, so, uh, so hurt and upset, I decided I will not speak Thai anymore. And I went away to Japan. I was in, in Kyoto for one year. And after that, you know, uh, kind of recovering and all, you know, finally I, I, I come to terms that, well, <laughs> I am born a Thai, you know, but <laughs> where can I go and what, what can I do? You know, it, it, I mean, even though you know, I'm familiar with uh, uh, America, I'm familiar with Indonesia, Malaysia and all this, but you know, to be an, in Bangkok, even though the traffic is so bad, you know, I mean, <laughs> this is it. So, I mean, uh, I was, yeah, I was very hurt. I thought that I wouldn't want to speak Thai anymore because I, I can go, I can switch over to Indonesia or whatever, you know. But this is it. I mean, the feeling of, of that time in, in uh, 40 years ago. Dominic, I, I think the term conspiracy of silence is problematic uh, because it implies some kind of orchestrated feeling or conspirators of how this conspiracy came into being. Right. I would argue that precisely what Ajahn Chanwit has said, the extreme violence, one of the qualities of extreme violence wherever it happens all over the world is that it's so shocking. And it could shock people into silence when the unbelievable appear before their very eyes. And it shattered the myth. Uh, don't, uh, forget that when we are talking about myth about Thai society, it's Thai peoples themselves are within that myth. We believe it. And so when something occurs before their eyes and it shatters it, I think it, it creates some kinds of a shocking uh, effect on many of us, uh, radicals or not, uh, thinkers or not, 
and, and we just don't want to have anything to do with it. Now what on earth is possible that you can desecrate bodies like that, props like that, you know, in the middle of the day, you know, in a sacred ground, you have the, you know, temple of the Emerald Buddha on one side, uh, city villa on the other side. And this is unthinkable for this society. And so the shocking quality of this kind of extreme violence, I think, needs to be put uh, into consideration. I disagree, too, that it's a conspiracy of silence, but maybe it's a conjuncture of silence. Many reasons, many reasons that a number of people gone silent and they happen to be about the same moment, the same time, even though totally different reasons. That's the subject of my book, by the way. Good. Well, I think we've uh, we've run around this enormous subject uh, quite adequately. Uh, it's very rare that we put on a panel this big and unmanageable, so I'm quite relieved it's uh, it's passed off. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank. Excuse me. Can uh, I have one last uh, word? Yes, of course. Okay. I think the silence. I'm sorry. I am Antena. I was also Tabasa student second year during the sixth October, and I never forget that day. And I think the silence is because we still don't feel safe to speak the truth today about what happened then and what happened before that and what happened many times after that. Who feels safe in this room to really speak up? I dare you. So there's no point about whether it's Conspiracy of silence is, you know, because it's a shocking thing. It was shocking. I was shocked. It changed my life. It's, I never been the same again. I came from a very, you know, more than a mark kind of aristocratic kind of background, and they taught me to keep to the structure of power where we all benefit as the people from that class. So I never looked on or trusted the student movement. I was in Tamazak, I didn't join anything. And I only wanted to do something after I saw what happened. And it was air on Thai television. I was at home. There was a cancellation of a uh, exam, so we didn't have to be there because of the protests. But when the killing was happening, I was relaxing at home and I watched the TV. And why are we still quiet and silent today? Because we cannot talk, because we cannot speak the truth. Let's come and face it. There were other events here that couldn't take place in the last few months, two years. There was an event that was interrupted here. This very place, this very room. When I saw the title of today's talk with the list of people on the panel, I thought, are they going to pull it off today? <laughs> Will I just lose my 450 baht to come in? <laughs> you know, including the BTS ride and all of that. I gave it a try. But so many times, we didn't have the chance or the safety to talk. There's a lot of cleaning up to do in this society before we really come to terms with what has really happened. And if you think about the people after my generation who were, not, who were not allowed to know what has happened on that day, who would never study in their history book, who never study in their uh, you know, social science book, 
nothing. How would they know? We were living in silence immediately after. When I went back to my university, when it opened again after several months, we were searched in our bags. More progressive teachers had their cars checked. Some teachers became were hounding other lecturers to try to check on them. We were not allowed to talk about anything. Every, many things were banned. So for many years, the people immediately after me were living and growing up in the dark. The only safe way to go on and to live is to keep silent and he keep your head down. How will we ever learn anything from our own history, our society? How will this society go on? And I would like to address some of you who are academics and who are teaching, who are responsible to pass on the knowledge and information and facts to your students and to the next generation. P please really do so diligently. Please don't deflect what is already happening. We are censoring ourselves all the time. And we have to, to survive, to live here. But you don't need to deflect your analysis. And please don't be true to history and to yourself. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Neil, in Denver, if you can still hear us. I still am. I've enjoyed the entire uh, evening very much. You can go and have breakfast now. <laughs> it was good seeing you, That's Neil. right. That's what follows now, breakfast. Okay. And you can watch the whole thing on YouTube. It'll be up there quite soon. Derek, Klaus, Janvit, Chowak, Tong Chai, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Great to see you, Neil. It's great to see you, and uh, I have to say that uh, this uh, hookup by Skype has brought back many, many memories um, of my years in Asia and uh, especially Thailand. Uh, my best and warmest greetings to all members of the FCCT, and especially those that I knew and worked with uh, those 40 years ago. We will, we will hunt down Dennis Gray and say you said that. He's at AP at the moment. <laughs> Good. He's Thank somewhere you. running wild in the hills of Chiang Mai. He's actually filing a big story at AP at the moment. So. <laughs>